afternoon, everybody. This is Gail Polubiak, the CEO and founder of Interview Academy, and I'm here today for our live presentation, finally. I certainly apologize for the technical glitch that happened uh, the other day, but uh, we're going to talk about how to conquer age discrimination in your job search. First thing, I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Could you raise your hand and let me know that, uh, that I'm coming through loud and clear? So far, nobody's hands are raised. Sometimes it takes a while to get used. There you go. Okay. Terrific. All right. Well, um, if you are one of those who tweet, if you want to use hashtag ageism webinar, that would be terrific. Um, what we're going to do, I want to talk about some of the housekeeping activities, like I said, use the, uh, the hashtag um, before and after uh, the webinar. And then last, the second thing I want to talk about is, you know, you have a question box there. So I'm going to try and be as attentive as I can about questions, though I'll probably take them toward uh, the latter part, unless you have a really big um, urgent need. And you will be getting a, a recording of the webinar. That will be emailed to everybody who signed up. I know the chance of being able to attend because of uh, the change in time may have been a little bit disconcerting for some people, so they may not have been able to make it. But I am, I, I don't know about you, but I am so excited because Look, I gave up a lucrative career as an executive recruiter because I passionately believe in this opportunity that you have if you are being told that you're overqualified or perhaps you make too much money or you're just feeling um, or afraid of becoming a victim of age discrimination. No doubt it is a, it's running rampant. But there's a way of getting around it. And for me as a recruiter to sit there and, and watch the herd go off the cliff um, because they just didn't know how to, uh, how to get around it was breaking my heart. So you really, it's such an exciting time. You have a chance now. There's a huge opportunity to re-engage with our economy rather than be victimized by it because I don't know if you've seen some of the stats that I've put up on the blog, but Deloitte has said in their, they've made a, a large survey and found that companies put gaining top talent as the number one growth initiative going forward for the next 10 years. Now, talent has taken on a brand new, uh, broader definition. It's no longer just who has the skills and who has the experience. It goes deeper than that. It's a more holistic. Everybody's fighting for this culture fit, and nobody really understands how to get it. And that leaves a huge gap in, in that where you can, you can fulfill it. And it has nothing to do with age. They think it is, but there's another way around it. Um, the other part of this opportunity is to be able to use your wisdom, your skills, to contribute in a bigger way. Um, the successful people that I know, one thing is common for them. They're always students, and they're always looking to serve their environment in a bigger way. And so that's, I know at there's a time when we want a paycheck. I get that. But um, I wouldn't sacrifice yourself. It's not that bad. I know it feels that bad, but again, it's just that nobody's really taught you, and that's my mission, is to help you understand, because really, uh, that's what's so cool about attending this, is that you can take just a few minor tweaks that uh, to what you have going on right now, and 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 turn the tables around instead of being perhaps feeling like one of those job seeking beggars I know sometimes that can happen uh, you can turn it around and actually become sought after talent and get multiple offers and multiple um, high and have companies actually bidding for you so let's let's just get right to it because I want you to live more financially secure I it is a scary place to live there and think oh you know look at your 
financial future and have to make all these sacrifices in your own mind to adjust, um, to lower your standards uh, just to account for the economic situation. But uh, I don't think there's a sacrifice that has to be made. I think right now it's just understanding what is causing age discrimination and then turning it around in your favor. So just a little bit about me. I started in executive recruiting in 1982, and i got to tell you, this looks really close to my desk. Um, we had little mini cubicles, but that was pretty much it. And I was living on a minimum wage draw, only getting paid what I when I placed somebody. So I would send candidates into an interview. Unemployment was over 10 percent, so it was really, really hard to get people into interviews, as you know. Um, and then, as with a recruiter, they want. I had to pay, I had to charge them 30 percent more. So when I had a candidate go in on an interview, it meant a lot. And I couldn't squander those, yet I was. I was telling everybody to remember to wear a suit, to tell, smile, sell yourself, good handshake, ask good questions, all of that. And it was, uh, I forgot to close my email, sorry. Um, so, um, Anyway, what happened was um, my candidates were blowing up. They weren't getting offers. So I took advantage of sitting at the feet of these hiring managers and getting their uncensored information um, and assessment of these candidates. And I really understood. I studied and studied exactly what was going on behind the scenes and why they were making their choices and where these candidates who thought they were interviewing so well were falling apart. And after a while, um, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, <laughs> after a while, um, it was just so frustrating. And um, I, I finally turned the table, and it was fantastic. I found a system that was working, and I became pretty good as a, as a headhunter. And I got full of myself. I drank a little bit of my own Kool-Aid. And so I decided, I had a new manager, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to go interview. So here I was at the top of my game. I had set industry records for getting people hired. And, um, and then I was interviewing with, with a woman who owned her own recruiting company that had been listed in Inc. Magazine two years in a row for fastest growing companies. And we were in an interview. The dynamics were such a learning experience for me because there we were. See how happy we are? We, I, we were bonding. I, w I was playing safe. She was playing safe. We both understood how important this was to us. So instead of doing what we practiced and what we coached people to do when they were interviewing, we were playing safe. And, and we were... What happened, ultimately, halfway through the, this meeting, I took a uh, mental note of what was going on and realized we sucked. <laughs> Neither one of us interviewed worth a darn. So I decided, I mean, it was such a fascinating experience, and I turned the table and I started to practice what I preach. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And it worked phenomenal. Would she have offered me the job? Eh, maybe. Would it have? Would the compensation have been as high? No way. I absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt the only reason why the comp that she offered me was as high as it was, which was way beyond her means um, or beyond her budgetary uh, consideration, was because of turning it around and really executing on establishing the needs as uh, I'll go into. So basically what I'm saying is I've been there. I know how, how easy it is to play safe, especially when you really want something. So uh, unfortunately to use, <laughs> I'm in Denver and this is not the best analogy <laughs> right now, um, but to, do, to use a football analogy, um, getting Bonding and building that rapport and playing safe may get you to the red zone, but um, un, you know, pretty much like Peyton Manning found, it's not enough to get you in the end zone. So the solution, once I found this, I, this system of what it took to get people placed, 
I was making incredible inroads with my candidates. And that's what I want to share with you today, because I really think it can serve you. Basically, what we first we want to talk about are the myths. I'm going to send out a poll, and I just want you to answer the poll and tell me what you would say. What um, are your beliefs about age discrimination? Just take a moment right now and answer and and put your answers down to select one either you don't think companies are going to um, uh, pay for top talent or they get threatened by you or maybe you just don't even think it exists it's just there aren't enough jobs or maybe you have other um, issues about it and somebody has another issue so I'd love to hear what that might be so um, let me share that, and you can see what we have. 50% feel that um, the managers are threatened, and we're going to totally co um, cover that today. So, um, and then we've got uh, some people that think that it, the companies don't want to pay for talent, and I'll address that. And whoever put other, if you could share that in the chat and let us know what your reason was for why what your belief is that would be terrific lost the poll just a second there it is sorry about that okay so going back we have a few myths many people that I speak to truly don't believe the companies want to pay for experience and you know that used to be the case the good news is with some shifts in how you talk to managers, uh, you can get them to pay and pay huge. Another issue is that managers, as we see, managers are intimidated. Yeah, that too. P managers have been intimidated. And lastly is that uh, a lot of people, we didn't cover this in the poll, but a lot of people think that the job descriptions out there are fact. When they say they want someone with seven to ten years that they're really saying they don't want anybody with more than 15 or they don't want anybody with more than 20 years of experience that's simply not true I'm going to tell you something that job descriptions the whole concept of a job description was created in 1942 by IBM this is how archaic and outdated the entire interviewing system has been and Companies are scrambling right now. They want the top talent. They want to find talent, and talent in a holistic sense goes beyond, like I said, beyond the job description, beyond the uh, skills and experience. And But it's also about um, they want the companies are looking for uh, dedication. They're looking for passion. They're looking for people who can help solve their problems. So what's really going on is we have a recession hangover. Meaning, what happened in the recession, what a lot of caused the recession was companies that were just run amok with the way that they were spending money. They reined it in, they got caught so fat, they cut out the fat, they cut down to the bone, then they cut out the muscle, they cut out everything. And they reeled themselves in in such a severe way that they reined themselves in. And what is the biggest buzz phrase you hear these days? It's best practice. Best practice is scaring the pejesus out of the way that companies are taking on with new talent. Because they're, they're working in a box. They're working. They're so restricted. They're scared to have anyone with experience who might go rogue on them. They're a little worried that people are going, you know, that are so good, they may not follow direction. And so you've got this recession hangover. And the good thing is that we're beyond a certain point. They wanted, they thought that they could hire younger people because they could grow their talent organically. So many talent management studies out there that talk about growing talent organically. And they, and they can't do it. They found that it is not worthwhile. The younger people don't have the wisdom. They, don't, they haven't been through the market cycles the way uh, most of the people that I deal with have. They don't have the experience. And what they might lack in technology skills, 
the wisdom and experience in vision is they just can't replace it with the younger people. So we now have this unprecedented generational shift that, and I don't want to talk so high level here, basically what I'm trying to do is just help you understand the landscape. I want to pull away the curtain so you understand what's going on. You know, I kind of follow a little bit of the St. Francis prayer, or even Stephen Covey pulled the line out too. It's, you know, understand before being understood. You're going to have a much approach once you understand what's going on be behind that desk with those managers so that you can take advantage of it, because that's what I want to do. I want to give you the upper hand. I don't want to teach you how to can any answers. I don't want to teach you how to be a puppet or how to jump through hoops. I want to, you're smart, and I want to take advantage of that smart by breaking down some of the, the barriers here. So there is an unprecedented generational shift that came out of us and basically bitch slapped us. We never even saw it coming, meaning you have now the baby boomers who are moving, unfortunately, involuntarily out of the leadership roles as the recession happened. They took away those big payrolls, replaced them with the lesser payrolls, and gave those leadership roles to the Gen X. And this is the first time in our history where the younger generation is taking the reins of control and leadership away from the older generation before the older generation is willing to pass them along. So we have the recession blast a lot of us out and you had these younger people who came in and took advantage and took the reins. Now we've got this horrible, horrible language barrier that is blocking us from getting people with more experience back into the workforce. Let me translate. We grew up with Superman. Accomplishments. Tell me what you did, tell me how well you did it. I did this, I did that, I learned this, I can do that, I've done this, and it's all about I, I, I. I'm Superman, I'm coming to the rescue. Unfortunately, the language coming in companies right now, that kind of language scares the pejesus out of them. Like I said, best practice rules these days. So you have to understand, that companies want people who just will follow the rules. And I know you guys will. It's just speaking a language that shows them that. And, and I'm going to give you a very simple template on how to communicate so that you're going to open these ears, you're not going to intimidate people, and they're going to see the value you bring to the table. And so Superman is out and Yoda is in. And Yoda, if you're not a Star Wars or uh, Star Wars fan, is he was that reluctant hero. And so that's what we want you to be. We want you to be a reluctant hero because managers just want their problems fixed. Under any sort of job description, rip that aside because it's nonsense and find out what the problem is. That's really what managers want. They, they're doing the job of two and a half people. They want the problems that are on their table gone. The other issue is they don't want any new problems. And when I say they don't want any new problems, they don't want anybody who's going to disrupt the team. They don't want anybody who needs to be babysat. They don't need anybody who needs extra attention. They just want to put the problem to rest. If they're going to hire somebody, they're going to pay big bucks for the people who can come in and solve the problem and not create more problems. And why? Because they want job security. And you all are right. The people who have said that you know they feel as though managers are intimidated, that they, you can do more than they can, well, you're half right on that. They are afraid of their job security. Unfortunately, where, where a lot of people are misjudging somewhat is, and I, not entirely, but sometimes I've seen more often than not, is the manager tr isn't thinking that you're too good and you're going to show them up. Because I hear it. They think you're a legend in your own mind. 
not that you are, but this is how it's coming across, that you're not going to follow directions when somebody can come in like Superman. You would never tell Superman how to do his job. Superman just does it. Well, here, that's the problem, is when you look like a savior, you look like the problem solver, that's where you're going to get yourself off. And that, so you, if you understand, yeah, these guys, everybody wants their job security. They don't want to land where you are. It's not good out there. They've heard the horror stories, and they know. But it's really, their issue is just fix the problem. So in order to do that, there's a simple template of how to talk to anyone, whether you are networking, whether you are talking in, a, in an interview, that's going to get the point across. And I think you've all heard value proposition. And here's the absolute simplest way of putting together a value proposition that will resonate and capture their interest and put you ahead of the competition and they won't even pay attention to your age. And that is, I help X by doing Y so they can do Z. I help executives in transition by teaching them guerrilla tactics and cutting edge strategies for job search and interviewing so they can get hired and start doing what they do best and maximizing their income. So in here are a couple of other examples. I help Here's X. I help sales teams who struggle with shrinking market share by deepening relationships in current accounts so management can reach their goals. See, this is how to present in a way where you are actually being the, the contributor. Not the savior, a contributor. And you're saying, I help people who have problems by doing this so their problems go away. Okay, here's another example. I help startups by implementing systems and financial processes as they're growing so they have the greater capacity to expand. So you're speaking from the point of view of your boss. Let me put it that way. Think of your boss before you got hired. What were their issues? What was that, what was really going on on their desk? Who, you know, everybody had a boss. I don't care if you're talking to the CEO. The CEO has a board. Everybody has a boss. And everybody's boss breathes down their neck. So what were they being breathed down? What were their issues? What were their challenges? Here's another one. I'm most successful when I can help teams that struggle to work together by building stronger communication systems so they complete their projects more efficiently. You know, this is a lot of language. I put these down in text and there's probably too much flowery language in here, but I hope you get the point. It's basically just speak from the heart. Think about the people that you have helped. It's not just the task that you were given. I opened a new division so that that's all about you. Turn it on to who do you help. I help companies that seek out new competitive opportunities. Now somebody can understand what you're saying, as opposed to, I had to open a division. Then it's all about you. What you're going to do is, if you can build this in such a way of, I help X, really get crystal on who you help, and really own this. I think some people have pushed back and they think, oh, I can't do that, Gail, because uh, I may not, you know, they may not need that. Well, you're right. They may not. And that's a risk. But the reward, when somebody does need it, you're going to really resonate with them. And they're going to, they don't care how many years of experience you have under your belt. They don't care how much gray is in your hair. They don't care or anything. All of a sudden, you get them. Then you add that value proposition with supporting results. As in, I help sales teams who struggle with shrinking market share by deepening the relationships and current accounts and uh, so management can reach their goals. And then you just add some real results. For instance, I help Technic Chemical improve their share by 3% after they lost share for three consecutive years. Now you're showing impact. 
it's not just talk. It's saying, and before that, I was re recruited by Baxter to take over a territory that was losing ground competitively and turn it into the fourth fastest growing territory. Bingo. That's all you need to say. Now somebody really gets, wow, this is what you do, and this is how well you do it in a way that's not braggadocious, as a more, it, it's more in a way that's supportive. And now they want to know more. It drives their anticipation of what more you can do. It drives their curiosity. So the age-defying equation is basically that. Value proposition, I help X by doing Y so they can do Z, plus your supporting results is going to equal success. So you've got to start early and start strong. And what I mean by that is you've got to do this in the early part of any communication that you have, whether you're in networking. You don't start off networking by saying, well, I'm a CFO. I've been an engineer. I'm a regional sales manager. You, you don't go with that. You'll just get tossed into the pile. You start with, you know, I've been in sales. Main thing I know is I, t I typically am most successful when I'm helping X by doing Y so they can do Z. And I've been this successful. Trust me, this will turn more heads. And I know it seems a little foreign, but honest to God, this, I cannot overemphasize how incredible this can be. This is fabulous in that initial interview question. Everyone, hear me now because this is critical. That question, tell me about yourself, when it starts in the interview, this is exactly, you don't go on some long, drawn out explanation of your resume, no, you give a very brief background, chronologically, you know, you just say, as you see my resume, I've been in the industry for 15, 20 years, blah, 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 however, now you give them your value prop with the significant results, and then you pivot meaning you learn more about their problems. So it looks like this. I've been in sales for a number of years. You see my resume, you know, but the main thing I know about myself is I'm most successful when I'm helping companies that really want to grow in different competitive markets by going in and deepening the relationships so they can ultimately increase their market share. For example, I did, you know, X, Y, and Z like I showed with um, Baxter and Acme Chemical. And, you know, I want to make the best use of our time today, so I can certainly go deeper in my background, but before I go too far, I want to know more about exactly what the problems are that you're facing. This is going, this is the start early and start strong way to take control, not in a barbaric way, but you've got to reestablish that, that interview. So you say, obviously I can share more, but I want to be certain to make the best use of our time. So before I go too much further, first help me understand what your key issues are. You're bringing this right to the heart of what they're trying to find. Do managers have an agenda when they interview? Yeah. I'm going to give you another tidbit of information here. Managers hate interviewing as much as you do, and primarily because they know it doesn't work. It's just a, it's a, oftentimes it's just a cat fight out there, and they're using some tools that HR has forced upon them, and so you've got to do, you've got to interrupt their pattern. That's the key. You've got to interrupt their pattern, um, and that's what this question does. I mean, think about it. If you were being, if you were the interviewer, and you had a candidate sitting there, and you had all this stuff that you had to do to interview them, but then they came in and started with, have uh, 15 years of experience in enterprise sales. However, I'm most successful when I, when I help X by doing Y, so they can reach Z, and here's some supporting results. And before I go too much further, though, I really want to understand what your issues are so I make the best use of our time together. Would that not, wouldn't you just love to have somebody break out of the mold and start talking to what really matters? That is the magic in this. And I know it sounds awkward, and 
but it's so easy. It is so, so easy to do. And after that, all those canned interview questions, all those, you know, tell me about your big, biggest weakness, tell me about, you know, all this kind of stuff. How would you do? What kind of a tree are you? All that BS will just go by the boards because it has no value. Once you truly start to talk about the, the most critical issue is their problem. And when you are perceived as somebody who wants to know their problem, cares about their problem, may or may not be able to fix their problem because you're going to speak to them in a way that let me t you know I either you can or you can't let's assume you can um, and if you can you say you know if I can't help you I know enough people in this industry I may be able to direct you to somebody who can once I have a better understanding of what you're looking for that's all they want they just want somebody and believe that believe me that's going to feed on theory of reciprocity meaning that if you promise to give them somebody who might be able to solve their needs, if you're not the one, they're more likely to help you. Say, hey, listen, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry this didn't work out, but you know what? I used to work at this company, and they could, they've could they been really hammered by uh, competition lately. I think they would love to talk to you. And then you, you, you get out of that vacuum of one interview, one job, and you, you start to see things in a much broader sense, and people start to refer you. So if you can just get out of, break that interruption, you know, interrupt that pattern of the interviewing agenda, focus on their problem, get them talking about their problem, it will be so, so comfortable, and you'll be catapulted to the top of the list once you get to that you know, to be able to move on beyond that. And some of the kick buck questions that you can use to deepen your understanding of what the problems are or what they really want, what how they think they want to fix those problems is, one question is, think of the top three people you've known who've had this role that you're interviewing for, and what traits separate them from the others? When I encourage people to ask this question, I want them to ask that question very slowly. Help the manager get thinking of specific people. Perhaps you can say, if you think about all the divisional sales managers that you've known throughout your career, people maybe you've worked for, people who've worked for you, people you've seen competitively, and you think about the ones that are really at the head of the game, the three best. See, as you say that, then the more you say it, the more they're thinking. And the more they start to engage in a specific person, the more real it becomes. And then you ask what traits separated them from the other people. I didn't say skill set. I didn't say experience. I didn't say qualifications. I didn't say any of that. I said traits. Because you can't train a trait. And I will tell you that anybody who's had any sort of position, they all meet the bottom criteria of what it takes to get the job done. But in any role, it you will see the traditional bell curve of performance. 20% are, we're going to call them management challenges. And they all have the same qualifications, but they're not that great. And then you've got that big glut of 60% that are just average at best. But then you've got the 20% at the other end, the impact players. These are the people that are usually that over and above. So they all had those same qualification skills and all that. So as we see time and time again, that is not the holy grail. The holy grail comes in that persona, in that the personal side. What are those traits that drive? So that's what you want to hang your hat on, and they will appreciate that question. Another question is, and, and I love this one, this is imagine you're a year from now. Again, you're getting them in their minds and picturing, and they're really engaged. Again, this is one of those pattern interrupt things. It gets them out of the question, answer, question, answer, clinical analysis, anything but the clinical analysis. That's a killer. 
So you say, imagine a year from now when you and I are meeting for my annual review, maybe, to, maybe even in this very same conference room. And as we're walking in, you give me this huge high five and pat on the back. What did I do to deserve such an enthusiastic response? Believe me, that question is never asked. It's so vital. They will treasure the fact that you asked that. And you will get a treasure trove of information. It might be, oh my God, if you could come in and just keep, bring retention down, uh, or build retention up rather, and get these teams to start to talk to each other, oh my God, that would be awesome. All of a sudden, it's not about an engineering project. It's not about any, you know, it's not about some system integration. It's about something completely different and in a far more powerful and impactful way. This will bring up some of the needs a company has and some of the deepest issues a manager has. If you could do this, you're hired. Basically, that's what they're saying. And that opens the door for all the things that you can do to get that to happen. And the last killer question is, how so? Tell me more. You've got to go deeper. Whatever they say, if they say, well, this is a new position, so it's hard to say. I don't care. Trust me, new positions are, are just not given like candy so that they can, you know, expand their job pool. No, there was a problem. Yeah, but what caused that? Well, we have, you know, we were really getting a lot more business out of the government sector than we had last year. So we're, you know, and so how so tell me more means, well, we might have some other people that we want to bring on to, to pick up the slack. We've got people right now that are, are working their tails off and they don't, you know, they're going to quit on us. Oh, now I got a problem. So you see, even with a new position, there are problems to be solved, taking the workload off of others. So, you know, really, it, it's uh, whatever it is, how so, tell me more. That allows them to talk more, to give you more ammunition on what they need so you can help focus on their problem. That's, that's absolutely the main thing. And the more you are concerned and focused and keep the, you, their eye on the ball of their problem, the more valuable you are going to be seen in their eyes. And don't wait to take control at the end of the interview. Don't wait throughout the agenda and the typical interview protocol of, okay, I've answered all your questions. Yes, I've asked some of mine, but they're not really digging into the problem. Then they're more clarifying questions. Uh, yeah, you're just tossed off as another candidate. If you start early and take control in the very beginning, you will dramatically change the dynamic and interrupt the pattern. You'll interrupt the age discrimination in a way that I cannot begin to articulate to you. It has worked for so many people, and I know it will work for you. So it's value prop plus results equals success. So it's how you have served others with these problems, what results you've gotten, and how it has served them. And keep focusing on their problem. I mean, that is absolutely the, the key strategy here. And I want to open it up for questions. If, I, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, and, and I will check out what you've got here. All right, Glenn, I am going to unmute you. Gwen, are you there? Yes. Yes, what was your question? <clears throat> oh, hi, Gil. I really like your presentation. Great. Real excellent. Thank you. Um, how do I convince a, a potential employer that I'm, I'm willing to take less of a salary than I was being previously paid? And I am. Gwen? I really want to work. Fabulous. Fabulous question. So excited you asked that. And I don't think that's uncommon for anyone. Attacking the salary is, are they saying, well, you're overqualified, why would you work for us kind of thing? Is that how it goes? No, they're saying, for example, well, you made X amount uh, in your last job. Are you willing to take 
basically 20% less. Okay, that's the entire, this is all goes back to the premise in the very beginning. The more you focus on, say, uh, first let me ask, are you currently employed? No, I'm not. Okay, so you, this is a time when you really focus on exactly what I'm talking about in your value proposition, knowing exactly what you do, how well you do it, knowing who you serve best. Say, I'm not here to take a paycheck. That's great. Uh, right? That's right. Right. So let me, and then you, you reiterate and say, I'm sorry, at the risk of being redundant, let me go back and explain. I am at my best when I help X by doing Y so they can do Z. And this opportunity sounds ex right in line with, with what I do best. And it is. This particular job is, yeah. Perfect. And then ask them a question. Okay? Take control. As soon as you say your piece, take control and ask another question. And you say, by the way, and then go random on it. <laughs> it really is just a play that they use, OK? They interviewed you. They knew your money. They know your qualifications. If they say, you bring so much more to the table, why would you want to take this job? And you say, aren't you lucky? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, you know, if they think that you're overqualified, they, you know, you say, you know what, aren't you lucky? Here's one of the issues that I should have brought up earlier on what makes these young bucks no longer attractive to companies. What they did is they got burned. Not only do they not have the wisdom and the skills and the um, experience, uh, but they also jump ship really fast. Mm -hmm. So that loyalty is there. So that's what I'm saying. These managers are afraid of their job security because they don't want to get they get spanked so many times for hiring good people who leave. That's really interesting you say that because I've had two telephone interviews with them. I'm waiting to hear back today or tomorrow for a face-to-face. -to -face. And both of them have said, um, well, how do we know you're not going to jump ship? That's it. And get Thank more you. money. To That's it. A job that, that pays more. Right. And I, my answer to them is, I mean, it's such a fabulous company. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, you know, and as I say, I'm not interested, I'm not here to take a paycheck. Right. I'm interested, to, I, I want to do interesting work and work that I do best. And get away from what you like to do, okay? Go into what you do best and how you can serve. You know, and you say, look, it, you're, what you're looking for is right up my sweet spot. You know, I'm at my best. I hit the cover off the ball each and every time I have okay. an opportunity to do this, this, and this. Remember, they don't really care what you want. <laughs> they really don't yeah. care what you want. They care if you can solve their problem. And not just this problem, but are you going to be there next year to solve another problem? Are you going to be there in two years? Are you, you know? Yep. That's what they. That's what I think their concern is with me. Right. They don't want you to say, "I'm here until I get a better offer." No, and I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be. I mean, I, I worked at a job for almost 27 years, and then I left to take care of my mom. Then I mm -hmm. took another job, and I got sick. And mm -hmm. but I'm fine. Yeah. And but I did spend almost 27 years with one company. Yeah, just stay away from taking care of moms and being sick. Oh, really? Really. It is no different than when a new, a young buck comes in and says, oh, yeah, I was on maternity leave. Uh-huh. But what do I say? I mean, there are gaps in my, I mean, I put it in my resume. What would you put in your resume? Um, let's see, for three years, help take care of elderly parent and work part-time as a consultant, which is what I did. I would just put consulting. Oh, really? Okay. And okay. Then the, it's, and, and yeah. the second one, I didn't, I didn't put anything. 
Yeah, you don't need to, that's too much personal information. It is amazing how many people inadvertently show their age and because people read it and they go, I don't get it. I don't understand. That's what my mother does. My mother is taking care of my grandmother. And, and they just don't understand the life issues. And it seems so out of reach. And I know when I was recruiting and ran my own firm, anybody who brought up anything about child care and all that, I was running for the hills. I'm like, I don't want to hire you. I don't get yeah, but the, the, the question then would be, why did you leave your job of almost 27 years? And you did it voluntarily. Yes, I did. You could go into maybe something, I would maybe make it more vague as, yes, I had some, you know, there were some family issues to attend to, and, a, and rather than steal from my company by taking time, I went into consulting. Okay, that's great. Does that sound a little sad? It does, and, and, it, and it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But then, get off. Get off. These are no questions that matter to anyone. They disappear once you get back to saying, let's go back to your problem. Okay. Because understand, they're asking, and, and you can maybe even even to paraphrase, and you might say, you know, I've heard this question from your team in different ways a few times, and I think I, I think what you're really asking is, am I here for the long term? Uh-huh. Rephrase it. That's great. I'm taking notes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, I have the worst memory in the world. Good. No, not a problem. Yeah. All right. By the way, I've, I've been, what was the, and, and the comment you said that um, hiring managers hate interviews, I've hired a lot of people in my life, and I hated every minute of it. There you go. And if someone came to me and started talking or making it a conversation rather than a Q&A, I would be like, oh, that's, this is great. And, <laughs> talking about, about, and talking about something that mattered to you, meaning your problems. Right, the, the company's problem, yes, exactly. Right. You know, and, and fine, oh my God, we get to put away the facade and all the BS, let's just talk. Are you mm -hmm. my guy or not? Mm-hmm. Period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they don't, they reluctantly keep their, their questions. So, um, let me see, I have, well, thank just, you. That, thank does you that help, Glenn? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Great. Great to hear from you. Good luck on your telephone interviews. I hope you, they call you. Thanks. Jeff, let me see. Um, oh, how do you get past the graduation data showing my age required on my application? Oh, another great question. I assume what you're talking about there is those online, those horrible online applications. And um, you know what? Applicant tracking software is absolutely the worst possible. Yeah, nobody wins from that. Understand that that is all HR driven. That template, that uh, job description I told you about earlier that was created in 1942, most companies, their HR department emails a template to the hiring manager, says, here's what we're going to post. Do you want to make any changes? And they have a couple of check marks, and they send it back. If you talk to the hiring manager and you say, you know, I've certainly read your job description. I, you know, I've understood. I, I've done my research, and don't say anything. Keep it at a clean slate, and you say, tell me exactly what you would want. What are the top four things you want? from somebody in this position, I will tell you right now, bar none, nobody can come up with more than two and a half. They'll say, I want somebody who can do this and who can do that. 
they cannot come up with more than that. So those applicant tracking systems, anything that is driven by a job description and keywords are absolutely horrible when it comes to people who fall outside of keywords and that's what people with experience do. So how do you get around that? Here's what you do. If you know the company, if you can figure out who the company is, I put out, you might even be able to find it on my website, it's the email triple threat. Oh wait, it was in my, uh, I think I talked about it in my um, three, uh, in the three videos. Anyway, the email triple threat is basically, you go directly to the company, you figure out who that hiring person is. And you can do that through LinkedIn or, um, that's my go-to resources, LinkedIn. Or it could be the company directory, uh, you know, their About Us link on any company's website has an About Us link. And sometimes they, they will list the key executives. Anyway, you, you find out who maybe the, the, head, the hiring manager is. And you email to that individual. And you email to that person's boss. And one or two people lateral to that person. Okay, so let's say you're going to, um, it would be reporting to VP of Engineering. So you're going to uh, email to that VP of Engineering, to the President, and to maybe VP of Sales, and maybe VP of Product Development. Okay, so you've got all those names, and you're going to write an email to each one of them. And you are going to make sure you say that you are emailing to each one of them. Not CC, you're going to do a two email to each one of them. And in the body of your email, you're going to say, I am writing this to you and person X, person Y, and person Z in an effort to find out who the most appropriate person is to talk to about. And then the position title. Um, to that end, I'd like to schedule a time when we can speak. And then in the body, in the second paragraph, you go through your value prop again. It was with great interest that I, uh, I, I did email, or I did apply. You do not attach your resume. And you go into um, your value prop again with that supporting data. The quantified stats is just absolutely paramount. It doesn't matter if you think you're a self-starter and all of those wonderful things, if you don't have the numbers to back it up. Somehow, some way, something has to show the value in a you know, more quantitative the better. Anyway, and then you follow up with, I'd really like to discuss this more, what's a good time to talk? Now you're outside of the app applicant tracking systems. Now you're outside of the computer. So now, and here's how it works. It, it makes it harder to keep you out than it is to let you in. If you sent that to one person, they have a delete key, and they will use it. <laughs> they said, but they also have CYA embrazened across their forehead. And if, if you send it to the VP of engineering, and she sees that the president received it as well. She doesn't want to be caught off guard. And the president says, hey, how about that, um, the, that Jeff Garrett guy that sent us the email? He sounded pretty good. You know, what were your thoughts? If the VP of engineering didn't at least pick up the phone and have a conversation with you, you know, couldn't very well say, oh, I blew it off. No, you're going to see why I and so this is a marvelous time to take advantage of that. So I will admit that resumes are, in my mind, resumes are a kiss of death. And they're a screening out device. They always have been. Once you're in the interview, it's a whole new story. So any strategy to minimize the risk of being screened out, the better. And that's basically my premise. Let's minimize the risks of being screened out. Let's let you do your best work face to face. And so that's my whole method. Uh, that's what drives my whole practice is how to get you face to face and not only face to face, how to talk so they hear you in the best way and not fall short with misperceptions. So 
Jeff, I hope that, and then you also had another question, uh, tell them, I'm at my best when I can make sure you sleep soundly at night because you know I'm taking care of this for you. You know, that's a little vague, I will say. I, I hear you, it's good, but it's a little bit over interviewees. That's, I would encourage you to be more specific about that. What makes them sleep more soundly at night? Think of, a, think of an exact situation of one of your bosses on when they weren't sleeping at night. What weren't they sleeping about? Was it shareholder value? Was it um, a cost overrun? Was it poor customer service? Whatever it was that wasn't keeping them up, at, you know, that was keeping them up and not letting them sleep soundly, be more specific about that. That, I think, will really get you there. And Gwen, we have a hand up again. I'm going to unmute. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, you mentioned LinkedIn. I took myself off of LinkedIn because I felt like um, I have four, four basically strengths that I can bring to jobs, and they're, and they're different. It's contracts, it's customer service, it's broadcasting, and it's management. And I felt like my LinkedIn, what I put in my LinkedIn was too broadcasting centric. And when someone looked me up, they'd think, oh, gosh, she's just a broadcaster, not a contract, you know, contracts person. What do you suggest I do? Just put just a couple points underneath my, go back on LinkedIn? Yeah, um, I am actually going to be putting out, I've got a boot camp that I'll talk about in just a minute, but yeah, LinkedIn profiles, absolutely mandatory. 97% of HR use LinkedIn first when they need to recruit. Okay. So if you're missing LinkedIn and you're not optimized for LinkedIn, that's a, that's a, that's a problem. Okay. All right. Makes sense. I guess I, I guess I can just make it short. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And but remember, I will say, as counterintuitive as it is, the more specific you are, the more engaging you are. Okay. Do you will do yourself no services by being all things to all people to try and cover your own assets. Um, okay. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it should be added. Okay. Like I said, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I have a boot camp coming up, and that's one of the primary areas is social media, how to optimize LinkedIn, and how to use it strategically. So um, that's, yeah. It, well, for example, I, yeah, for example, I was a vice president mm -hmm. at a broadcasting network, and, you know, broadcasting is kind of on its way out. And I'm really not Media. looking to go back. And, media. Uh, Take the word broadcast. You got to put media. Okay. But for example, this company I'm, I hope I'm talking with next week has nothing to do with media. It's a it's a uh, consulting huge consulting company mm -hmm. that does j jobs all over the world, and they're looking for someone to do contracts for them. And I I love I'm good at contracts. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, there, there are a lot of different areas um, that uh, more than I have time to go through right now, though, but of how to optimize. But uh, I, I just want to say that the keeping your eye focused on I help X by doing Y, it doesn't mean you have to say I help broadcasting companies. I help, you know. Chances are the companies, in the, or the, you know, I know you work with one company, but you probably had some sweet spot in what you did, something that just woke you up. You, you know, that project that if they put that in your lap, man, you were the go-to person for it. And okay. so, you know, it could be I help teams that are uh, that struggle with process management. It's somewhat generic, yet it's very specific. It's not industry specific. It's not anything else. It's just function specific or okay. specific. What problem are you the best at solving? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Jeff mentioned he's the best at taking care of problems, and um, and that's a wonderful thing if we can just make that a little bit more specific. You know, okay. I just, everybody wants to be a go-to person, and that's what you need to do. That's value. 
It's no longer an employee, it's value. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Does anybody else have a question? Okay, well, we have reached the end of our hour. And, um, I, oh, I forgot, I had one more thing to share with you. We're, as I mentioned to Gwen, we have the uh, Get Hired Boot Camp coming up. I hope I gave you enough to really be valuable to you today. And judging by some of the questions, it's like, oh, there's so much to talk about because there's so much that's not known out there. And, and there's so much that is known and it's so canned and artificial. And I know that you guys are just so close to pulling the trigger on it. If you just, like I said, get out of the red zone, get into the end zone. But uh, if you can, if you enroll by five o'clock uh, tomorrow, uh, I've got it set to save 25%. And you'll be getting an email from me with all the information on it as well as a replay to this and and I would love to know if you have any questions send them in my in your email reply uh, I would love to know if I went a little bit over some areas and and didn't answer some questions as well as I should if, if I leave you with any unanswered questions I'd really love to help out so Anyway, uh, as I said, this is Gail Polubiak. I'm CEO and founder of Interview Academy, and I know there's a huge opportunity out there for you. It's just going to take just a little tweaking and rearranging, pretty simple template to work with. If you use it and, and make it worthwhile, love to hear how it goes for you. Ask those killer questions and see what kind of results you get. And until the next time, I uh, wish you a very great day. Thanks again for coming. Take care.